be sharing in this ecumenical service of worship with you. I'm Kevin Snaman from the United Reformed Church in the UK. And wherever you are in the world, and indeed wherever you are on life's journey, you are very welcome in this virtual space. I grew up in South Africa, and I do pine after the African bushveld. It gets into your soul, and those of you who have been will know what I'm talking about. I love the evening chorus of the guinea fowl, or the dazzling flight of lilac breast rollers, and sitting quietly at a waterhole watching the majestic elephants come down to drink, or watching the busting wildebeest jostling one another to get the best spot for a cooling drink. One of my roles in the United Reformed Church is oversight of our Global Justice Programme. And I can tell you that we in the mission team have sleepless nights over the threat posed by climate disruption. Not only for the wild places of the earth, but also for the lives of farmers in some of the most vulnerable regions of the world. Places like Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, not to mention Bangladesh, Zimbabwe and others. We know that these farmers and their families have contributed least to the climate emergency, but they are kind of at the forefront, at the face of the very worst effects of the crisis. The rise of COVID has torn aside our comforting illusion that the global economic system can somehow be made to work for the poorest. If anything, inequality has grown infinitely worse. Ethiopian Dr. Tedros is right to point out and to warn of the enormous moral failure of rich countries who get to vaccinate their people long before our sisters and brothers in, let's not call them poor countries, let's call them what they are. They are the exploited countries. We in the global north are behaving no better than those bullying wildebeest, shoving aside the weaker ones to get down to the water first. So yes, while we do love mercy, and we may even want to believe that we walk humbly with God. But are we doing justice? Fair trade is an attempt to do justice. We know that. But why are farmers still struggling? Why is our trading system still balanced in favor of the powerful few? Farmers are finding the rate of climate change far greater than their ability to mitigate its effect or to adapt. And yet, even as we beg companies and consumers to pay a little bit more for their favorite drink or snack, to help these farmers escape poverty and to adapt to the environmental shocks, still the strongest are enabled, indeed encouraged by the system, to shove their way to the front of the queue. The irony is, of course, that many indigenous farmers know their lands, they know their, their techniques, they know their, their crops far better than we do. They are eco-aware in ways that we can't begin to imagine. But somehow our economic system encourages those people to ignore the indigenous knowledge in pursuit of profits for large corporations. Fair trade is one of the few pushbacks against the system. It is one small attempt to bring about some kind of equity in what is a relentlessly unequal economic environment. But we do need so much more. As a Christian, I want to start with Jesus. But I do think that the way that we've been taught the gospel is a problem. Certainly the way that I was taught to read the Bible growing up in Africa well, would have been consonant with David Livingston's three C's in a civilization, commerce, and Christianity. But as African womanist theologian Isabel Peary reminds us, Africans by and large experience the gospel as a tool of colonialism, of racism, of sexism, of classism, and indeed of exclusivism. The author of The Color Purple, Alice Walker, tells us this. When I was 13, I stopped going to church because I felt that they had taken this huge, amazing, incredible godness and whittled it down uh, and stuck it into a church every Sunday when people were really too tired to listen and fell asleep because they were exhausted from still being slaves. Our mission team in the ORC is grappling with the growing realization of the deep and largely unconscious nature of white privilege. We've discovered that we are still deeply complicit in the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade. All of us benefit from the way our economic systems are arranged precisely because they still reflect the inequalities of those awful times. You do know 
that the flow of wealth to this day is out of the global south and into the impossibly deep pockets of the wealthy nations. And again, one of the few ways we have at our disposal to, to address some of these deep, deep concerns is to choose fair trade. That is how, in the short term at any rate, we can work to improve the livelihoods of farmers and producers. We also know that buying fair trade can assist farmers in their environmental adaptation. Fair trade tries to provide farmers with a decent standard of living, enough to cover all their farming costs and to cover the costs of the basic human rights like a nutritious diet, children's education and health care. But the environmental crisis is not going away and so we need change at a far deeper level. Or rather, we need them changes at multiple levels if we are to truly do justice. And so we need a transformation of the global economic architecture away from interest-bearing debt. We need to change the story of our human purpose in the universe. We need to reconnect with our rightful place in the Earth's ecosystems. And by the way, that's not at the top. And then we need at our core to allow for a deep transformation at the spiritual level. Jesus was pointing out a similar need for transformation in his hearers. Why do you only pray for those who love you? It is not enough to be concerned only for those who are like you. You must pray and act for those who are outside your group, even if they persecute you. Erna Kim Hackett warns about the way people who grew up reading the Bible like me, and she calls it Disney princess theology. Why is it, she asks, that many Christians see themselves as the princess in every story? They are Esther, never Xerxes or Haman. They are Peter, never Judas. They are women anointing Jesus' feet, never the Pharisees. They are the slaves escaping from Egypt and never Pharaoh. And it means that the people in power, she goes on to say, have no lens for locating themselves rightly in scripture or in society. And it has made them blind and utterly ill-equipped to engage in issues of power and injustice. I am challenged then to work for justice at more than one level at a time. I want to support fair trade. I want to make sure that the wealthiest pay their fair share of tax, or indeed more than their fair share. I want to work immediately for substantial debt relief for the poor. I also want to work for an economics of life that overturns the tables of the debt-based economic system, in which the wildebeest are free to hoard all the water for themselves. But at a much deeper level, I will be praying for the breaking in of the kingdom, where things like fair trade will no longer be required because all have learned that abundance and sharing are far better than artificial scarcity, competition and hoarding. I pray for a fundamental transformation of the heart that both heals the planet and orders those rowdy wildebeest. Will you pray and work with me so that all can share the waterhole equally. Amen.